example, there's as much creativity in you know, developing the algorithms and the user interface and the, you know, the, the coding and things as there is in design of the building. Episode 88. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And a quick note about today's podcast. This was actually recorded a few weeks prior to the coronavirus pandemic. Hence, I was able to go and visit Brydenwood in their wonderful studios on the Grazing Road in Hoburn. So now this interview for me, I think, was one of the most mind expanding and brilliant conversations. And I feel very privileged to be able to see and excited as well to see these kinds of pockets of the future of architectural practice emerging in the industry. And I really think Bryden Wood is one of these organisation is one of these architectural practices that is reshaping the future of the built environment, how architectural practices can operate and how they can combine technology, the expertise of uh, manufacturing, how they can bring those benefits on site, the technological advances with um, the delivery platforms for their government assets. And what really excited me about speaking to Jamie Johnston, who is the director and head of global systems at Br- uh, Brydenwood. He's been working there for since you know the last 24 years, since 1995. So he's really been there from the very beginnings of the company and he knows the business inside out. Um, yeah, and what was saying, what was really exciting for me in this interview was the relationship between um, their delivery and the client and this very intimate understanding of the client's problems before making any propositions, before even dealing with any architectural solutions is this intense data-driven uh, modeling, understanding of what it is that their clients are actually looking to solve. And I think this is a really deep thing and it's very architectural architects we understand how to do this we can be brilliant at doing this this is this is the role of the architect but often we find ourselves responding to a brief or we're res- responding to um a site or you know we're, we're already answering the question with an architectural built solution as opposed to using architectural tools to deeply interrogate what the problem is and this kind of diagnosis process this is something that we talk about on the show a lot about um, marketing very well, understanding the client's problem, and by able by being able to understand a client's problem of such precision, we become much more likely to win work from that person. So, join me here. Uh, the conversation kind of starts as uh, Jamie's in in mid conversation because we were in flow, and I just wanted to capture. A, like everything that was being said because it was absolutely fascinating and by all means leave me comments and let me know how you enjoyed this conversation so sit back relax and enjoy jamie johnston of bryden wood so massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the business of architecture uk for the last couple of years big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events attended the webinars and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles and as you know we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you so what i wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and i'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and i'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Yes, you were explaining the the platform up in Russia. Um, Yes, we called it, actually we called it the, the chassis. We referred to it then, that was the sort of term we used at the time. Um, so when we came back from Russia, 
we thought that was a really good was a really good idea actually, and it's not quite sort of oven ready for the UK market. Mm. So there's certain things about the regulations and the likely supply chain, um, but we did quite a big bit of internal investment to develop that from the kind of version we developed out in Russia into a kind of more generalised version that we could then use for. Um, UK residential, we didn't really have an outlet for it. Mm. We put a big amount of effort into developing the system and um, uh, yeah, getting it to sort of a, a point where it was nearly ready. And then we took it around a number of people and I think it was maybe a little bit uh, ahead of its time, but that was the genesis of platforms actually. A lot of the thinking that went into that was the stuff that eventually turned into the kind of cross-sector platforms that we're now developing and talking about and that government's been discussing. So that a lot of this, the internal research, because this is... It, in a way, it sounds like it's kind of, you know, you're being able to preempt the market, or how? What are the sort of discussions that happen internally to be able to sort of decide on where an area of research is going to be directed? Um, it's a fairly short process, um, or is it? Or is it kind of like data driven <clears throat> in terms of your marketing, or in terms of like here's a good sector that we want to be moving into next? No, it's much more, uh, I suppose, intuitive. Maybe yep. is the word. So because of the, so we we can sort of um, not with any great clarity, but we have a sort of long longer term vision of if the world we're using platforms at scale, what would that market look like, and what would you know what would need to happen, or what are the blockers that are likely to get in the way of that happening? Um, so sometimes we can sort of see things that no one's asked as a question, but we're thinking if I were a client. The next question I would ask is this one. We should have an answer ready for that. Yeah. Um, sometimes people come to us quite a lot of time. You know, people pop up and say, "Look, this is a really interesting area that I think we should be exploring, or this is a new capability we should be developing." And we go, "Yeah, that sounds good. Off you go." Um, sometimes there's sort of big trends. So, for instance, sustainability has been high on the agenda for a long time. Uh, but obviously worldwide events have meant that suddenly massively escalated. So one of the things we'd, we've started putting more effort into last year, we expanded our building physics team and all the kind of capability simulation you can do around energy balance calculations and things. We've started working closely with aggregate industries on uh, lower embodied energy concrete. Uh, we've started talking to the steel suppliers about what's the pipeline for steel that's made through electric arc furnaces because... Once the grid's decarbonised, that's the lowest embodied energy. We're doing a lot of investigation into CLT. Um, so that's going to move very quickly up the agenda to go, and actually, we should have some really good, and it's an incredibly complex area, but we should have some really good data on the real impacts of carbon of all these different building methodologies. Uh, firstly, because someone's bound to ask us that, but also just to sense check that where we're pursuing a particular platform, we need to know actually that that really is the most sustainable way of building and that we're not missing a trick or we haven't missed something because we were focused on the, the, the existing systems. So yeah, it's a real mix of things that, that, that pop up and interest us. So, so from your career being here, um, how have you seen the company evolve? Like how, what was it like in the in the beginning, and what are the sort of kind of key phases and milestones and sort of triumphs that you've had to to what it is now as a kind of international like global organisation with s satellite offices in in Singapore and Barcelona. What was it like in those uh, early so, days? So in the beginning, there were three of us. We'd rented a desk in Alan Baxter's offices on Cowcross Street, and it was me, Mark, and Martin. I used to. Um, Builds a lot of physical models, actually. Uh, so now, obviously, the software is caught up, but you can you can do things digitally much much more quickly. But I was very quick at doing. We always worked in three D, um, so I was very quick at creating physical models. So we'd you know Martin would sketch some ideas, I'd turn it into a model, we'd hack into it, and we'd use that as a kind of way of um, expanding ideas. So that was uh, yeah, that was sort of back in the early days. Oh, we used to the other thing we used to do. Yes, remind me actually. So we used to make one-to-one -one, uh, mock-ups of things we were doing. So we worked very early days for a hotel developer who wanted to do a um, modular hotel system. So we had a particular idea for how to make the bar from this incredibly compact but you know sort of beautiful productized thing. So we went and bought a load of foam board and we bought a you know a sink and all the bits. So I used to make one-to-one -one mock ups of things. So I used to physically make a thing that was dimensionally the right size, mm. but it was all made of you know 
cardboard and foam materials and bits of plastic and things. So we always had this sort of, um, yeah, working in 3D and then working at a whole range of different scales and then very quickly trying to get into kind of one-to-one, -one, um, which we've never lost really. So now the, the prototype centre in Rockley, that's the kind of big version of that where we actually get proper steel and concrete. Um, so I think that was, uh, yeah, because of that level of integration we were doing where we were always thinking in terms in th things in terms of products, that then kind of prompted us to start getting the other disciplines in-house again so we can sort of take a, a yeah. punt on the wiring loom and the drainage and all the rest of it that so, we're building in. But so, so you weren't, were you ever like kind of traditionally selling yourself as architectural services or was it always this kind of alternative approach of, you know, working one-to-one -one and kind of providing a holistic set of solutions? Uh, and and how and how did you how did you come up with that? What was the what happened preceding that this is an this is an idea? Um, so Mark and Martin were both at Grimshaw's. So we started in ninety five February ninety five, uh, which is coming up for twenty five years yeah. in a few weeks actually. Um, so Mark and Martin were both at Grimshaw's, and they so they both like you know loved the kind of high tech aesthetic. Um, and I think there was a, a sort of very rich culture in Grimshaw's of a sort of pride in developing not only the design but also right down into the details. Mm. I remember the Grimshaw's were famous for the kind of you know the detailing of the staircase and the cladding systems and things. So Martin particularly worked on the cladding systems for Western Morning News and things, where he'd you know, developed the boss and the, the you know, he'd developed that as a system. Um, so there was always that kind of. Uh, background of being able to develop not only the kind of overall building but also go right down into the you know all the way into the details which again is I think was a sort of when I was at college that's what I thought architects did the yeah Valvo sort of Alto like you were the OTA you were the complete master builder that was the kind of heritage um, and I think they were both a bit frustrated I guess they were building they were designing these kind of high-tech buildings uh, cutting-edge buildings but on site it was still you know, traditional activities and traditional um, ways of building all the same problems we have, low productivity, all the rest of it. Um, and it was around the, the Latham report had come out and sort of criticised the industry and said, here's a number of recommendations around productivity and things. Um, so Mark and Martin set up Bryden Wood, I think with that basis of, you know, we're, we're going to start to think much more clearly about you know, how to move from construction to manufacturing. So I don't. I wouldn't say we ever. Um, yeah, I don't think we ever sort of sold ourselves as traditional architects. Yeah, there was always some interest in productizing things or the kind of you know very very close links between architecture, engineering, and you know mechanical, electrical, all the rest of it. So even before we had the capability, we had the sort of vision that that's where the industry should be heading. Uh, or well, the old example is, you know, Christopher Wren, the master builder, would have known all the detailing and, you know, known lots about the masonry. And over, for good reasons, I think, over time, we felt that the architects had sort of lost that. Mm. So uh, one of my ongoing frustrations is that uh, the role of architect, which used to encompass everything, has kind of split itself. We work on projects now where there's a concept architect, executive architect, interior architect, facade architect. It's sort of fragmented. Um and then you get people who only work on a particular stage, so you get people that work on kind of you know, stage naught to two, and then it gets handed over to a contractor. Um, people are trained to work within their discipline, so they're architects or mechanical or electrical. Yeah. Um, and so you, uh, yeah, you sort of think no one of the industry is struggling because people only see one section of the design through one discipline lens, and often only in one sector. Yeah. You know, right, so no wonder people are struggling to. You know, what design for manufacturing assembly or modern method construction sits across all of those boundaries and all of those sectors and all of those um, disciplines. And you go, right, no wonder people are struggling to get that kind of elevated view and start to develop the kind of, you know, some of these techniques because that's what people are trained to do is work in one little yeah. piece of the puzzle. Um, so I think we always had a view of kind of trying to elevate that and think, well, how can I consider things much more holistically and uh, you know, work at a much more integrated level and then start to think not in terms of construction but in terms of manufacturing. So, yeah, 25 years ago that was um, uh, yeah, perceived as being slightly niche. 
And yes. Now, obviously, it's starting to become more and more mainstream. And but it's, it's interesting as well how, what you're saying about, you know, the, particularly in the sort of large infrastructure projects and the, how micro-niched people's roles can end up becoming. And actually, one of the sort of powers of the of architectural thinking is this ability to be able to sort of join the dots and be able to have this kind of elevated position of, yeah. of seeing everything. But then the sort of ec- economics of construction often... Uh, and also marketing as well kind of drives people into specialisms. Yeah. How did you guys avoid falling into the pitfall of becoming, you know, just dominated or specialised in one niche? Or are you actually specialised in lots of different niches um, and you're able to kind of make a kind of clear argument about the relevance and the experience you've got in one sector that is directly yeah. applicable? Um, it was incredibly hard work for a long, long time, because you can imagine we used to go for interviews and uh, yeah, we go and talk to someone in healthcare, and they go, how many hospitals have you done? Go, yeah. well, none, but we've done pharmaceutical facilities, which are also complex facilities. And they go, hmm, yeah, and then the hospital people would turn up and they go, oh, good, someone who's done. <laughs> like, so I know, I know why people end up sort of getting into a, a particular particular sector I think the where we probably started was we would do so some of the early projects we did with the, with the airport Heathrow Airport so the the work we were doing the the real problem was it was a you know very constrained logistically difficult security controlled site uh, and it almost didn't matter what sector it was the the thing we were trying to solve was the kind of complexity of how much can I take away from that and how little can I do on site or how productive can I make people on site. Um, so some of the early projects, actually, the thing that we were brought in to do was not that sector specific, but it was, you know, super complex, tricky sites. They go, all right, I've got a <laughs> difficult right. site, uh, which was good. And we demonstrated loads of the kind of the, the benefits of design for manufacturing assembly. But we kept saying to people, look, the fact that that was successful and productive and high quality and all the rest of it wasn't because it was an airport wasn't because it was a difficult site it was that's just a way a good way of building actually you'd get even more benefit if you'd let us do it on a greenfield site but no one would so we had lots of meetings with people where they'd say yeah sounds really good when you've done one of my sector come back because then i'd be really interested and i'd love to deploy it but do i want to be the first person who lets you lot loose on whatever it is yeah, not really so there was always a sort of risk aversion so yeah we did there was a long period of sort of very hard yards of just slowly building up the um uh case studies and sort of slowly building up the capabilities and you know building up the kind of evidence base but we were always determined not to get kind of trapped in a sector because we always thought like if the stuff we're doing is of any use like it's useful across sectors a lot of the kind of the, the thinking of the, the application of this isn't you know, sector specific. It's much more to do with sort of the way we build things, and actually, yeah. the way we build things is pretty similar. The way, you know, almost regardless of, of sector. So, but I think now we've got to, we've we've because of that. Uh, the other thing we always thought was if I can, there's bound to be some learning in one sector that I could cross fertilize. So because the kind of sector boundaries exist, I bet there's things we're learning yeah. one that I can almost instantly import across. And sort of ways of thinking. Which it, is, is is there actually a lot of um, sort of specialist. In, uh, wealth of expertise that you have in dealing with the complex clients so dealing with pharmaceutical companies de- dealing with you know the companies like BAA or who, who organize these are kind of large multi-headed mm. corporate companies where you've got to deal with at any one time you know five six to more different stakeholders and you've yeah. got to get different agreements so as an architect or a designer making proposals you've got to be able to speak you've got to be multilingual in the way that you're presenting ideas yes has that become quite a sort of like you're quite you're pretty skilled and obviously like i know you know from my own experience at grimshaw they were very good at being able to uh, present ideas in a kind of logical procedural almost yep. a, 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 like seemingly engineered way of optioneering things that made it very palatable for those kind of clients is that a, a, a strong part of <clears throat> yeah i think because we uh so I don't know if you recorded the thing about chip thinking, or should I explain yeah, that? To, yeah, again? explain the chip thinking. Yeah. So okay, there's there's a step before that. I think one of the um, things we did well, I would say, I say it myself, but I think one of the things we did well in in some of the early days was we would often get called in to be 
I would describe it as a translator between the kind of concept architects and the fabricators. Right. Um, so, for instance, on Terminal 5, we were brought in to do a kind of production design. So what we'd, we'd said, look, you're going to have lots of different subcontractor design packages and they'll all do a you know, great job of their bit of the design, but all the interfaces between them are going to be really painful because you'll get closer and closer and closer to the point of touching and no one wants to be the person that does that the bit where they come together. Um, so we'd said, look, if we can take, if you gather up all those subcontractor design portions and we'll do you know, all of that type of work. So it's for the internal fit out. So it's all the internal walls, internal roofs, the glazing systems, balustrades, stairs and things. Um, and we said, so we'll develop the kind of working drawings and people will literally fabricate off our drawings, um, which was interesting. But we said the, the reason we'll do that is because then all of the interface will work beautifully. Um, and actually, because we, you know, we'd done a lot of the kind of prototyping, we'd, we'd you know, developed all these systems and physically built some of the, the um, bits of kit. We're saying, so we sort of trust ourselves to know that level of detail. And again, the sort of heritage from, from Grimshaw's of you know, developing glazing systems. Yeah, yeah. But we described ourselves as a translator and said, look, we are architects, so we speak architecture. So we will understand, it was sort of Rogers did the very high level design, then Pascal and Watson were doing it to sort of one to a hundred, say. So look, we'll understand your architectural concept, protect that like it's our own, but also know the constraints of what the fabricators can plausibly do for a cost and a, you know, within budget or within time. So we'll sort of take your vision, protect that and interpret it in a way that these guys can build. And these guys will trust us because we know enough about you know, welding and fabrication and all that kind of level of detail that we can have that conversation. And you'll trust us because we know enough about what you're trying to, to envisage. And actually that uh, worked really well that we became the sort of trusted party that Pascal's could explain something to us and know that we would go, yeah, I've got that. I've understood the kind of the architectural things you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Now I'll go and talk to the guys who do the welding and the fabrication and work out what's the grain of steel and the bending radius and the, you know, where to hide the fixings and things. Yeah. Um, so with that, with sort of a, the, that kind of later stage of a project, taking a concept and developing it all the way through to the kind of nuts and bolts, we were, um, yeah, I would say very good at. Um, and then the, the shift into the earlier stage stuff happened on healthcare where we were given a brief for Circle Reading, which is our first hospital. Um, and we started asking, the original ask was to develop a kind of DFMA approach to healthcare. We said, yeah, we can do that, that's fine. Um, for that to work, we really want to fix the design like as much as possible. So obviously you want to get the design relatively fixed so you can then start to think about the kind of uh, componentization. Mm. And as we were designing it, the brief was kind of shifting a little bit. Um, so we started asking some fairly pointed questions about how the brief had been written and you know how did they know how many theatres they needed and how many consulting rooms and all the rest of it. Um, off the back of that, we started doing some analysis of you know how many procedures in the theatre, how long to set up, scrub, da 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 da, da. Uh, And we proved that you could do everything they did with five theatres, not six. And that was the start of a sort of journey then of developing yeah, all these kind of early stage interrogation, now sort of analysis and data analysis type tools. Um, and over time that turned into a thing we call chip thinking. So we take a building or a process, we split it up into steps or chunks. Um, so the example using healthcare is that a theatre never just ha is, exists as a theatre, it always has the clean core, dirty core, anaesthetic room air handling unit, clean and dirty circulation, surgical staff, clinical staff, consumables, there's a whole load of things that form a theatre. So we'll have a chip that represents that with everything we know about theatres. So we'll go and talk to the surgical guys and say, tell me everything you know about a theatre. Talk to the FM people, the cleaning staff, the um, uh, yeah, every type of stakeholder. And that became a way of... Uh, yeah, once we started creating these sort of chip libraries, so in pharmaceuticals we've got certainly hundreds, probably thousands of chips representing every stage of every process of every drug and every kind of consumable that's made. Um, that became a really good way of engaging stakeholders and saying, right, so tell me everything you know about your particular specialism. Yeah. 
we'll drag all that knowledge and we'll embed it in the chip. And then when we put the chips together, the idea was it's like chips in the motherboard. You'd plug them together and then you'd play back to clients uh, what the impact was. So we said to Glaxo early on, we don't know anything about pharmaceuticals, but luckily you do. Mm. So we don't necessarily need to know. I mean, now we do, but so we don't necessarily need to have your level of expertise our job is to aggregate your expertise and sort of play it back to you and tell you what the implications were. Um, and so we'd find these really interesting things where once we'd, because you often have these sort of stakeholder groups that don't talk to each other, so yeah. process don't talk to commercial, don't talk to you know, the chemists. And once we started aggregating all that stuff and playing it back, we'd, we could say, look, so the implications of all the things you've told us are this, and it would mean a facility that's, the size of 15 football pitches because so, everyone gets what everyone wants. So this this very data-driven approach or this kind of interrogation of, it's not even the brief yet, it's kind of interrogation of like how they're actually operating and what, what, they're, what they're wanting kind of precedes, yeah. precedes any proposal making whatsoever. Yeah, so... Um, uh, yeah, so it started, in, say, it started in healthcare of this sort of interpreting the brief and then it moved... Uh, so GlaxoSmithKline have a process they call front end factory, or right. uh, front end, yeah, which is um, rather than come with a brief, they come with a problem statement and say, so I want to achieve this business outcome. You know, what's the best way of doing that? Uh, we actually have found that very often the answer is not to build a new facility. So the, the presumption is that they need a new facility to make X amount of a new drug or replace an existing facility. We'll go away and do a huge amount of kind of data gathering and uh, uh, discrete event simulation and you know, our, uh, analysis of all sorts of things. And very often we find that there's latent capacity in existing assets that can be unlocked if you change a shift pattern, change a line, buy an air handling unit and get two more people or something. So the, very often the answer is not to build a new building, it's to change the way that you currently do things yeah um and again we don't know many people that have you know that, that massive search space of ideas that includes not building a building so a traditional you know architect consultant the answer is probably a building you know? <laughs> whereas we start from completely first principles um and one of the ways we did this we we started uh, a new language with them which was around divergent thinking so opening up the problem as much as we possibly could rapid prototyping, fail fast, iterative thinking. So we started this process of um, yeah, doing the kind of simulation very, very quickly, testing lots and lots of ideas very quickly. Um, it got to the point where we'd said, look, we can't have a traditional process where we design a thing, send it to you, you comment, send it back, and then we work on it. It's happening too fast. Mm. So we started moving Glaxo people here, um, giving them space in the office and saying, actually, what we really need is a team that has some of our data people, some of your subject matter experts, maybe some of your external consultants who are specialists in a particular thing, aggregating that knowledge, testing these ideas very, very quickly, um, and rather than develop sort of maybe one or two concepts. For a site, we'll develop 50 different things which are really quick to do because of the chip thinking, and over time, we'll start to narrow down that space of, of possible solutions down yeah. to the ones that are kind of most optimal and do, do the most things um, which people thought we were yeah people couldn't quite believe we were going to invite the client into the office it's, it's amazing we're going, well, you know, we've got you know, more than happy for them to sit and listen into the, all the conversations that we're, that we're having about the, the problem um, and actually what, what we found was that firstly our increase in productivity more than paid for the space yeah um, because people came to our office kind of left their badge at the door it almost gave people permission to think a bit more broadly and ask a few more questions because we were starting from first principles we'd you know do the kind of five whys thing of why is that why is that why is that and sort of get everyone back to first principles mm. which puts you in a sort of different different space and we just found the kind of richness of conversation and bringing together all those different disciplines different parties who wouldn't necessarily have ever met in the corporate world yeah. looking at the same problem uh, it transformed the way we design things and actually we'd, we'd get um, where we'd ended up on a solution quite a lot of the time not everyone gets every single thing they want but because people can see why we've had to compromise in certain areas for the overall benefit of the project they go yeah actually that's quite a sensible call I can recognise why 
maybe I don't get the kind of absolute perfect thing that I would want, but I now recognise that because of site constraints and commercial pressures and, 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 yeah. that's probably overall the best solution. So it, it, it changed the way rather than sort of issue a report, say, and have to you know talk people through it, Everyone went. No, no, I was there. I remember the conversations. I know why the the you so, know, you're making that recommendation. And yeah, that's sensible. I, I... So, so, do your clients still relate to you as architects in any kind of way, or or do you would you even call yourself like architects still, or is this because this is, you know, it's such a it's such a, a different way of approaching working with a client. You know, you're not waiting. It's not reactive. It's, yes, it's much more proactive, and you're not necessarily. And you understand that you're aligning your sort of propositions when they do come much deeper with the kind of client's business cases. Yeah. And this is a kind of a industry conversation that comes up again and again and again. How do architects explain value? Yeah. And this is, you know, this is it. This is, you know, kind of being that intimately involved with the mechanisms of how uh, the business operations of a, of a client is working. And you're able to be there and kind of interrogate it. Yeah. And and, and do you still have to go through... Say like you know, working on airports, you know they have like large framework agreements, and do you still have to be involved in that kind of procedure and pitching to get onto those types of lists, or has this been a way of kind of circumventing lots of those the traditional routes into clients? Um, yes, we started using as a placeholder. We, we used to use this term "total architecture," like total football. So the idea was, um, we used to say to clients, "Well, this is actually, I mean." This is the role of the architect, isn't it? Is to understand your need, is to understand the brief, is to develop the thing to have you know the the, the, the complete view of every aspect of the you know, construction, operation, procurement, like every aspect of the building. So, um, I suppose we partly think we're sort of reclaiming that role. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting when we've spoken to people at Reba, uh, things like the kind of two-stage D&B projects, for instance. Um, I think there's a lot of frustration architects that they do the kind of concept design and when it gets handed over to the contractor, there's a certain element of, yeah, yeah, something a bit like that, but much cheaper as they value engineer it, which often means just down-specking things. And so I think there's a, uh, yeah, frustration with some architects that actually the process doesn't work that well. They don't get that kind of control and they don't get to see the, you know, the vision they had properly enacted because it goes through so many different yeah. stakeholders. Whereas, because of the way we're sort of taking much more you know, much broader view, and certainly through things like the platforms where we're hard coding a lot of our thinking into the components, you're going right. If we can design it and make it you know, highly productive, better quality, cheaper, quicker to build, then no one wants to. You know, we've done the value engineering. We've kind of embedded that in, and then therefore you'll yeah you'll deliver exactly our vision because that's the the optimal way of doing it. So, yeah, well, I think we've we don't think of it in terms of not being architects. We think of it in terms of this is actually what this is architecture. This yeah. is this is what it what it is. We're sort of you know maybe rewinding the the cock to when architects had a greater thing. So I think there's also um, uh, a load of skills that architects have, which are you know exactly the sorts of things we're talking about. So as an architect, you're taught to creatively problem solve, you know, come up with solutions within constraints. You're taught how to lead a team, engage with clients, talk there's a load of skills that you go right, you know, that we have all the capabilities, but actually often you don't get to use all of them because of the way the contract's set up or, or whatever. So um yeah, I think certainly uh, yeah, clients still see us very much as architects. We all, one of the things someone said recently in the office was about the the word architect it gets used in like the architect of the peace process, for instance. It gets used as a kind of not necessarily just in the context of people building a building. It's someone who's kind of led this whole process. And we go, yeah, I quite like that that, that interpretation. Um, so we do. I mean, we still bid to get on traditional frameworks. We do find very often actually we go through the kind of framework process but people recognize that they didn't have a slot on the framework for some of the stuff we do right because they didn't know they should ask for it because they didn't know it was a thing yeah so very often we get on a framework through a sort of fairly traditional route and turn and go anyway we go on the kind of architectural and in, you know cross-discipline framework brilliant so now we're in the door actually what what we could do for you is these other things or sometimes people come in so circle reading was a good example they came in for the dfma and actually they stayed for the 
you know, business case and the kind of more analytical stuff that we did. Mm. So very often people come in for one thing and say, well, can you do me one of these? And you go, I can do, but could we have a conversation about rewinding the brief or you know, reinterpreting? So I th- it, uh, there's a sort of new thing, I think, over the last couple of years where people are coming to us for that complete set of capabilities but certainly for a long time, people would come in because they go, oh, you're all the off-site guys. Yeah, yeah, I'll have some of that. <laughs> we go, yeah, before we get to the off-site bit, there's a whole process we like to go through. Or, I mean, a lot of our clients are repeat clients, so people like uh, Circle Health and um, GlaxoSmith client have mentioned, you know, things we do at the airport. We like to have these kind of long-term relationships. We go, so on the first project, so we won't get to do all the things we'd like to, so we'll do a good version of this over time, this is where we'd like to get you. We'd like to get you into this kind of data anal- analytics, uh, you know, front end factory space and design for manufacture and, you know, better capability and things. But we recognize that's not going to happen day one. But if we work together, so Circle used to talk about a direction of travel. Right. So we would try things and some of them would work really well, some of the things wouldn't work very well. And Circle would say, look, but I can see overall the trajectory is in the right direction. So I'm willing to accept a few things that didn't work because overall things are improving. And again, we like those kind of relationships with clients. So as I mentioned, Glaxo, they've been here for six, seven years now continuously. Other clients... So so for for that long, they've been in the office? Yeah, and it's it's a shifting cast of characters... So do, so do you have numerous different clients in the office together at any one period of time? Yeah, so this this floor, um, yeah, for listeners, this is the seventh floor of our building. This is all collaboration space. Right. So when we were doing the Ministry of Justice uh, Prison Estates Programme a couple of years ago, it was completely chock full with, we had uh, Mace, Keir, Interserve and MOJ in. Uh, we've always had Glaxo people in. We've got... Uh, we can't name some of the clients. We've got Landsec people at the moment, actually. We've got Landsec, Langer, Rourke, and Arab people looking at the, the platform thing we're doing for Landsec at the moment. We've got some other process clients in. So, yeah, it's a, it, it changes on this floor depending on what we were working on. But actually, one of the um, uh, really powerful things has been so, for instance, John Dyson, who is the VP head of global projects for Glaxo, has now left Glaxo and he's based here three days a week. Um, one of the guys who worked at Circle is now based here. So we've had some clients actually go, this is great. <laughs> like this, I will come and work here and partly be a uh, translator between Bride and Wood and the original client, but also I now get to talk to other clients. So quite often when we've got a potential client come in, John Dyson from Glaxo takes them for a coffee. Yeah. He said, well, don't talk to us, go and talk to John because he's had your job. He has been on the client side. He's gone through that process um, he can explain it from a client's point of view in your language and if you think that sounds interesting then great but mm. he can answer questions in a way that maybe we can't so, that, so we encourage people to you know, run into each other and chat over yeah coffee. I mean that, that's such a unique collaborative environment of having like your own clients within the same space actually talking and mingling yeah. with each other and actually that there's a whole load of new problems you know, solutions that can be you know that and it's a new way of sharing yeah. information and how else how, how do you kind of collate a lot of this research and and also just for the, for the listeners what's what's the kind of current anatomy of the of you know who's in the building right now um so from our side in terms of our sort of makeup of the office or who's, yeah who's, the, the different disciplines um so i think we're probably nearly half architects right I should work out the numbers, actually. I think we're a give or take a half architects. Um, we've got a team called Creative Technologies, right. who are 20% of the office, give or take now. So they are the people who've been developing uh, things like the rapid engineering model for highways, the RAID uh, workflow for network rail, the Prism and Seismic apps that we've launched um, last year. They're, they've got you know virtual reality, mixed reality specialists, uh, user interface, robotics, so that that team creative tech, currently 20%, I think most of them are architects, like 90, 95% of them are architects, but with a particular interest in... Right, a special specialism. ...these ways of working. So again, if you talk to them, you know, they think that's the, the role of the architect encompasses all that stuff as well. There's as much creativity in... You know, developing the algorithms and the user interface and the you know the, the coding and things as there is in design the building. Like yeah, they all you know that's a, a, a 
you know, as much a valid part of the kind of creative design process. And I think it's going to expand over time as more and more of our assets are developed using sort of evidence-based you know, technologies and rapid simulation and all those things. That's just a... Uh, yeah, there was certain disquiet maybe from some parts of the, the industry about the sort of prism and seismic, the fact they were open sourced and that they democratise the design process and things. Our view was always, well, it's just another you know, tool in the toolkit. Um, so, yeah, the more tools you've got at your disposal, the more things you'll try, the more ideas you'll try. That doesn't limit your architectural freedom in any way. It gives you another... So that's a platform sharing details, information... Research code. Yeah, so these are we've, we've published the code for those. You know, they're they're web based, so they're completely free to use. You don't have to download a bit of software. None of the data gets stored anywhere, so people can go on, do a piece of design, and then you know, import it back into their servers. But it completely removes any barriers to entry. But also, yeah, you could see certain people saying, "Well, how are you going to monetize that? Are you getting all the data? Are you nicking the data?" It's going, no, no, it's just it's out there. It's completely. You know, free to use it's open. Th th this, th that's a very a, a, quite a big culture shift as well for the way a lot of the architects practice where we're kind of very you know there isn't that kind of sharing of, of details whereas in IT and tech you know the sharing of code is kind of it's just what yeah, you do yeah, it's yeah. Just, just the natural the natural language and you look at companies yeah. like Tesla they're kind of making all their patents um, available for for everyone else to be to be using yeah um, that becomes an incredibly powerful resource so the our um, mission statement. Uh, I don't know if it's on the website yet, but the, the kind of the, the internal sort of mission statement is uh, to improve societal outcomes through a better performing built environment. Uh, which, so for instance, you know, everyone knows what's happening with um, climate crisis, and uh, UN predicts population is going to top out at four and a half, uh, eleven and a half billion. So there's like four more billion people on the way. Climate's already at breaking point. So our view for a long, long time has been that there's no point us being the cleverest people on the cinder. There's no point anyone you know, owning all the answers and going, brilliant, I'm going to commercialise that. Yeah. And yeah, unlucky the rest of you. Um, I think that you know, the problem statement we as a planet should be saying is that there's, we're going to have 11.5 billion people who all... You know, need and deserve the best quality healthcare and housing and education and transport infrastructure and water infrastructure. Da, 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 da. So the problem we should be setting ourselves is right. How do we, as a planet, sustainably support eleven and a half billion people, and that's it. So, you know, no one should be trying to be the only winner in that game. Yeah. No, no, no. It's the opposite. We should be giving everything away. We should be sharing as much stuff as we can across the industry. Everyone should be using best practice and building upon it. Because I think one of the things that's really held us back is this yeah, protectionist attitude to IP. Yep. So uh, how many people are inventing a volumetric modular system at the moment and they've got their own secret version of it? And again, it's not that dissimilar <laughs> to any of your competitors. It would be, you'd all move a lot quicker. Everyone would move a lot quicker if rather than trying to develop things for their own benefit everyone was publishing everything and everyone was building on that and you change the culture completely into one of, you know, how do we collectively accelerate the industry? Because people are only moving as quickly as their own sort of R&D allows them to. And you yes. Go, That's daft, isn't it? We yeah. should be joining forces because remember, we're building the built environment for the 11 and a half billion people and uh, yeah, it, I don't know why people haven't clocked that that's a huge problem that we as the industry, so yeah, I'm sure you've seen the figures, 39% of uh, carbon emissions are a result of the built environment. And so we are, the construction industry will one way or the other decide the fate of the planet. And it sounds a bit um, high stakes when you say that, but you know we have the opportunity to either really dramatically change mm. what we do for the benefit of 11.5 billion people, or maybe we'll make a bit of extra profit and well done after you go, no, no, get over it. Yeah, <laughs> but we yeah. just need to completely transform the conversation. With, so, with 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 your stakeholders or with with some of your clients, how do you make the um, how do you make the, the business case for them that you know the, a lot of the details and information is going to be is going to be widely available or like if you're working with clients like I know with, with sort of energy infrastructure for example they can be yeah. incredibly protective about you know you know because obviously there's this kind of security things involved and yeah, 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 yeah. How, how do you how do you navigate that kind of world and how do you, how do you and I, and I do, I think it's really interesting, you know, again, 
use Tesla as an example where they're kind of putting everything out. As there is a you know there's strong precedent for this new model of sharing information is 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 has a very strong business case to it. And how, yeah. So how do you communicate that with your clients? Um, so we have a, a a pretty grown up conversation with clients fairly early on and say, look, you are as a new client, you're benefiting from everything we've done for everyone before you, and. So, so okay, a good example actually in the early days. So, GlaxoSmithKline, we've never so we've never patented or protected anything we've done. Mm. Um, GlaxoSmithKline said, "Look, my core business is making the world better, and I happen to need buildings to do that. But oh, it's a pain every time <laughs> I do. So, actually, if more people use the building system that you've developed, I would get buildings quicker and cheaper. And if I could ring up the building industry and say, I need an antibiotics factory in Nigeria in two weeks, can you get on with it? And they went, Yeah, no problem." That would be amazing, wouldn't it? But as it is, I have to go through this laborious process every time. So people like that said, look, actually, I'd rather the industry moved on because it's not really my core thing, building buildings. Yeah. So we said to the so clients, look, you're benefiting from all of the things that you know, Glaxo have paid for and Circle have paid for and all that kind of learning. But the next client will benefit from the stuff we do with you. So if you join us on this journey, then everyone benefits and you get... You know, a load of ideas that are paid for by other clients and vice versa. And hence, again, the sort of um, conversations on this floor. We take or we host dinners for sort of existing and potential clients sometimes, mm. which we don't go to. So John chairs them. And it's a chance for the clients to talk to each other about what's going well, what's not going well, what we should do next. It's almost like a sort of steering group. Yeah. Um, and it gives them enormous comfort that... You know, they're not alone, that they're not outliers when they're sitting there going, oh, right, so these guys are here and Landsec are here and Glaxo are here and, you know, Circle are here and, okay, right, this is a, you know, these are all sort of <laughs> large enough clients that if, as long as we all keep moving forward, then, you know, we could collectively shift the dial. So we have that sort of conversation and there are, there's certain things, um, there's certain things that for clients will say, look, the, the thing that we're developing you for you is so specific to your building type and so uh, commercially important that we'll take that offline and protect it and that's a thing that you can own. Um, but it tends to be some sort of you know, really specific, we call it physical IP, so some sort of really specific thing which is only really useful to that client but yeah. really useful and we'll go, yeah, that's completely fine, we'll, you can own that. But a lot of the things we do are more sort of generally applicable. So when we're looking at automated construction and the way of... Um, Reducing people on site and boosting productivity. Uh, the prototype we've done recently was for Landsec. We said, but actually, you can imagine if that works, like that methodology is works on any sector. So we shouldn't be, yeah, we shouldn't be owning that. And I think people accept that. And uh, you know, I think the clients that come here tend to be the ones that are maybe more enlightened or have a sort of broader view, um, and yeah, want to kind of change the industry and want to be part of that sort of movement. And so yeah, we don't get. Uh, yeah, there's always a bit of to and fro about the IP thing at the start, but I think broadly people kind of get it. When they come here, they go, look, I'm coming here because of, you know, I'm joining this sort of club of clients. I'm getting the benefit of all that. I want to do my bits, move the industry forward. And uh, yeah, we don't tend to come have people come in and go, anyway, but I'm going to own the IP and it's all yeah. it's all mine. There's also, I mean, it gets, some of it gets a bit abstract. So there's generally a thing in, in um, contracts, there's any of the background IP is ours, foreground IP, maybe they get to own. I can't even conceive of what some of the foreground IP would look like without the background stuff. Right. You go, look, it's built on this kind of massive heritage of everything we've done for all the different clients and tested and prototyped. So I can't even imagine what foreground IP would look like without any of that stuff. So it becomes a bit of an academic exercise of who owns what anyway. Yeah. And you go, look, so much of the kind of... And again, sometimes we, when we see a thing coming, this is why we do some of the R&D ourselves and go, actually, it'd be a lot easier if we just had the background IP anyway. So if someone's likely to ask us to do a thing, sometimes we'll just get on and do it and think, well, at least then we don't even have to have that conversation because it's instantly background stuff that we've, we've developed. Yeah. And um, So what then becomes the relationship that you have with the, 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 the physical manufacturing process itself? And are there sort of... Um, you know, are you working with a lot of different kinds of contractors or the sort of those types of relationships? How's how's that work? Um, it's really variable. Uh, it's not like you have one sort of 
one contractor that you're always working with to develop a system, or is it you're approaching lots of different? No, we. Do, I mean, we do different things with lots of the different different players. Um, one of the things that's I think particularly interesting is we're now because through the, the the platform stuff we're developing, we are talking to aggregate industries and Tata Steel and uh, a little company called Laser Cell and you know the the system houses for for glazing. So we're actually missing out the kind of tier one, tier two system and we're going direct to either the manufacturers of the material or the commodities or the individual components. Yeah. So very often what we're doing at the prototyping centre is sort of working at almost component level, developing all the systems and processes and things and then going back up and saying, so that's how that's done. Uh, you talk to these people and here's how you buy these bits and here's how that, that stuff goes together. So th- I think there's a sort of industry-wide conversation at the moment around what is the role of the tier one in in the future, I think lots of the tier ones are having that conversation mm. internally. Lots of the conversations we've had with people, they can see the big change is coming, and there's a sort of we don't know the answer yet, but there's certainly a kind of reshaping of people's mindset. So, for the Landsec project, we've got uh, what we call the manufacturing assembly manager. So, we don't call them a tier one, they're a assembly person, and they're it's like CM. Construction manager right, for okay. DFMA, so there, so Landsec are talking very directly to the supply chain. Uh, the MAM is there to kind of make sure the bits arrive in the right sequence with the right health and safety and all the kind of processes and things. But they're not a traditional tier one. Some of our other clients are going more directly to the tier two market and saying, "I don't want." Uh, so obviously, if you're buying things directly at component level, all the benefit stays with you, but. That's a different procurement model. Not yeah. everyone's geared up to do that. So other people are saying, look, the risk profile of that is a bit high. So maybe I'll go down to the sort of you know, specialist frame people and buy it from them, and they'll then get the components. So we're, yeah, with a few clients, we're sort of exploring different ways of procurement, uh, yeah, how involved they want to be and how far, how much benefit they want to get in there for, but what their risk profile is of sort of going all the way down into the weeds. So again, that's one of the, a lot of the things we're having debates around at the moment are not, technical questions like the technical bits largely been solved a lot of it now is about the procurement and warranties and you know ip and insurance and funding and you know a lot of it is the kind of those other functions that aren't really to do with the physical yeah. physical bits of the building so what's next what's next for 2020 it for bryden wood uh so the wish list would be uh so that the apps we've got so we've, we've developed a number of apps so um Prism Seismic uh, Rem Raid, whether we'll do it this year, you could conceive of a world where all of those start to link up. So as you're developing your you know, housing solution in Prism, it's also looking at, you know, how much where you'd place a school and that feeds into seismic and you know what's the transport infrastructure you need to support that. So uh, I don't think we'll get to it this year, but you can certainly see a, a over time we think those kind of digital apps will start to cross-reference and that will mm. be kind of... You can imagine then, once we get into the platforms bit uh, properly, again, we won't do it this year, but you could conceive of a, of a sort of digital marketplace where as you're developing your platform model, it's saying, so these are all the people that can supply the, the different components and here's where they are and here's this be the carbon footprint of buying them from these different people and here's the price and creating that sort of digital marketplace. So I, I think that the, you know, that digital uh, you know, simulation testing procurement space is going to um, expand vastly over time. Um, we're, I'm design lead for the Construction Innovation Hub. So over the, certainly this year, we'll be starting to really get to grips with you know, what are the other platform components that we haven't developed yet and what are the different... Uh, Things we'll need in that kit of parts. So I think this year, I'm hoping now that you know, politically things have settled down a bit. Yeah. The IPA will sort of resurface, and we'll see the next um, next bits of government's thinking around the the PDFMA stuff they they published in 2018. We'll start to see sort of a more uh, increase in maturity in terms of the departments of how they're going to interact with this. And so I think the hopefully the kind of public policy stuff, the IPA stuff. Government procurement will start to accelerate that in step with the, the Construction Innovation Hub. Mm. Um, we've got projects that will be on site this year with platforms, and uh, there's a couple of potential clients that, yeah, I could 
yeah, I would love to kind of expand the <laughs> platform into into some other sectors that, that we're talking about. Brilliant. So yeah, I th- yeah, it's been every year we think yeah, this is the year that <laughs> we'll make the big leap. But every year it feels like there's still so much to do. What I would love actually is that um, uh, if I had a, a one thing I'd really like is for for someone else to start because we open sourced all the code for Prism and Seismic and things. Uh, we'd love for someone else to report back they've taken that code and done something with an extended the functionality or you know, we wanted those apps to be the starting point of a community of people who would be you know, like Linux or Unix or something like developing those apps and starting to, to build it so I'd love yeah, other people to join the party yeah. uh, and obviously we'd love other people to start working on platforms adopting platforms one thing I did a sort of internal thing yesterday I was saying we need to stop thinking of platforms as a technical solution and think more of it as a movement so BIM was never really a technological thing. It was a mindset shift or a you know, change agent. I love platforms to stop being thought of in terms of the physical bits and start being talked about in terms of the platform movement of you know people joining the movement and accelerating the journey. Whether that'll happen in 2020, don't know, but I'm going to keep banging on about it anyway. Love it. Brilliant. Jamie, thank you so much. No trouble. Thanks for coming. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.